Welcome to Emergency Medicine Topics in One Coffee. I'm Alan Giles, I'm an emergency physician, and today's topic is going to be aortic dissection. Now, this is not uncommon, life threatening condition that presents to emergency department. It famously killed King George II while he was straining on the commode, an inglorious way for a monarch to die. Also killed Lucille Ball of I Love Lucy fame and many, many others. So let's just have a think about the pathophysiology briefly of what an aortic dissection is. The strong uh, jet of blood from the left ventricle strikes the aorta and rips through the intima. As it dissects through, you can imagine that somatic pain is quite horrendous. Now, as it dissects along, it depends where it dissects to, the sort of pain that you get. Most commonly, the initial break of the in into the intima occurs in the ascending aorta or around the subclavian, the left subclavian artery. Now, with that, if it dissects in the ascending aorta, you tend to get pain that's in the chest going to the throat. As it goes down through the thoracic aorta, it dissects down, you get an interscapulary. As you go further down, you might get in the abdomen or down into the legs. Ever since William Osler in 1910, they've been saying that people mix it up with angina. And sure, there are times when the two of them might get mixed up. But generally, the pain that's associated with an aortic dissection is different to that that you get from the squeezing ischemic pain of angina and infarct. This is the ripping somatic pain. People come in writhing in pain generally. And even when you give incremental morphine, it doesn't seem to make a lot of difference. Let's go back a little bit more about the history of the examination. One of the best ways to thinking about aortic dissection, the way it could present, is thinking that if it rips ongoing anterogradely, it's going to knock off some of the vessels off the aorta. So if it knocks off or decreases in, in the lumen size, um, dissects into the left subclavian, what's going to happen? Well, you're going to get an ischemic left arm, it's going to be painful, you might have decreased blood pressure on that arm compared to the other side. Let's go down, to sec further down, we have the spinal arteries, they might present with pain and paraparesis. To sex down, celiac axis, we're getting an ischemic gut, okay? To sex down further, we might get a white leg, we might get an ischemic as it cuts, as it goes down into the left um, uh, internal or external iliac vessels. So it can present in a number of ways. If it rips back retrograde, then of course you could get the right common carotid, or the left common carotid. Um, and with that, you could get right hemiparesis. As it can, goes further back, the brachiocephalic trunk, which means you could get an ischemic right arm, or you could get, at the same time even, paraparesis on the left-hand side. If it dissects even further back, it can dissect into the origin of the right coronary artery and you could get an infraposterior or proximal RCA infarct occurring at the same time. Beware of the person who's writhing around in pain with a proximal right coronary artery um, infarct. It just doesn't quite make sense. Normally people don't writhe in pain when you have a proximal RCA. They're nauseous and hypertensive, but not writhing in pain. And finally, of course, if it dissects into the pericardial sac, you can get pericardial tamponade, which often kills you. Okay, so patients present like this, uh, you're concerned about it, you're wondering what your investigations will be. Well, most of the time your ECG, your ECG is going to be normal. And you can look at the chest X-ray, but this is not going to be abnormal most of the time. It's not like the traumatic dissection that you get where you get mediastinal bleeding and whiting in the mediastinum. In this, the mediastinum is often normal. If you're able to do a bedside echo, it's possible you could get a view down and see a dissection flap. But many emergency departments, especially out of ours, aren't going to have that luxury. So both of us fall back to suspecting it and getting a CT with contrast. This will show uh, the lumen and also show where the thrombus is uh, and to show exactly where it is, whether it's proximal or whether it's distal. So 
We touched on a little bit about what sort of treatment should be done. Well, of course you're going to be giving incremental morphine. Now that's only reasonable. But to actually get the pain under control, usually you'll need to decrease the heart rate, give a beta blocker like boluses of metoprolol or an esmolol infusion to get the heart rate down to 60 and then use ideally an arterial dilator like sodium nitroprusside. And this decreases the head of pressure that's going into that dissected lumen. And that's when the pain starts to settle. Some places who are not um, as comfortable with using sodium nitroprusside may commence with GTN infusion as a temporizing measure to drop the blood pressure because they're used to titrating that. Now remember that once you've done this, you're gonna to have to make sure you're involved in intensive care and cardiothoracic nice and early. So what sort of definitive treatment is there? Well, if it's a proximal dissection, usually there's, it's an operative treatment. If it's a distal one, quite often, still now, it's a non-operative treatment. One a few other tidbits about dissection. One thing is always suspected. Another one is if someone with high risk factors such as Marfan's or Ehlers-Danlos comes in, syndrome comes in, if they've got chest pain, prove to me that they don't have a dissection. And probably one of the most important things you can remember is any person who comes in with chest pain or back pain with neurological symptoms, prove to me that they haven't got an aortic dissection. Okay, well I reckon that'll just about do for aortic dissections in one coffee. Cheers, I'll see you next time.